Today, I'm speaking with democracy hero, Katie Fahey. Katie was a self-described political novice in 2016 when she posted on Facebook calling friends to join her in combating gerrymandering in Michigan. The Facebook post received an outpouring of support and eventually led to the formation of the grassroots group Voters Not Politicians and their proposal to establish a new independent redistricting commission. In, no in November 2018, the Voters Not Politicians proposal passed with 61% of the vote. The Citizens Commission is expected to draw the first lines for the 2022 election. Now, Katie works as the Executive Director of The People, an organization that inspires everyday people to become involved in the political process. Congratulations, Katie, on your successful work to combat gerrymandering in Michigan, and thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. We're excited to have you on. So Katie, you started Voters Not Politicians through a two-sentence Facebook post where you express your desire to take on gerrymandering in Michigan, is that correct? Yes, yeah, I did not think it would end up leading to me running a statewide ballot initiative to amend our constitution. Um, just kind of was a frustration put out into the air and then I saw that I wasn't alone. There were actually thousands and then ultimately millions of people who were really concerned about this in Michigan. Can you tell me more about your thought process going into that Facebook page post what led you to? Yeah, well, the 2016 election was really interesting. Um, I care about politics. I didn't love it or anything, but I paid attention to the local elections. And in 2016, I saw a lot of my friends and family paying attention for what I saw as one of the first times. Um, and when I was uh, talking to them more about why they were excited, it really ended up being because of two different candidates, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. I was like, I wonder if they have anything in common. And as I stopped to think about what their core messages were, the drain the swamp and political revolution, I think both of them were speaking to a frustration that a lot of people have that the whole system needs to come down, that politics isn't working for the average person. And we especially saw that in Michigan. Um, and though right after the 2016 election, the internet was a pretty ugly place. Um, There's a lot of name calling. There was a lot of you voted this way. So you're this, you voted that way. So you're this. And what I was seeing though, was that a lot of us had shared concerns over the same things. And so I thought, you know, maybe a way to tear down the system could actually be changing the rules to create a new system around gerrymandering. Some of those things that impact our votes are even counted. And so that's where I wanted to focus my energy because I thought that maybe it's something that Democrats and Republicans could agree on and that would actually help fix politics so that our next election can maybe be less focused on how do we tear down the whole thing and how do we elect the right people to make change. So it seems to me that this post really evolved from a nonpartisan um, or even bipartisan understanding of our common frustration how did the organization then, Voters Not Politicians, evolve from there? Yeah, so um, it started with just me and my coworker at the time, Kelly, who uh, I had made the post in the morning and then went to work and she was like, oh yeah, I think that's a great idea. We should do something about that. We made a private Facebook group with the very catchy name of Michiganders for Nonpartisan Redistricting Reform. Uh, Voters Not Politicians quickly replaced that once we found out we had people with marketing experience. Um, and that Facebook group is where we took people who were interested in organizing and being a help of you know, how we can actually end gerrymandering and a place that we use to meet and to collaborate on actually taking steps to do something about it. Um, in the beginning, we literally had to Google, how do you end gerrymandering? Uh, <laughs> and found out that you could bring a lawsuit against the current maps, or you could change the rules for how the maps are drawn and who draws them, which is what we ended up doing so that it was fixed um, indefinitely, hopefully, in Michigan. Uh, or you could try and work with the legislature, but we had seen that in Michigan, there had been over 14 attempts by the legislature to try and do something about this, but it never had bipartisan support and it never even got brought up for a vote. So that was really a dead end to go to. And we reached out to other groups to see what they were working on and slowly but surely we just found a place for where each of us had our own talents and skills and how we could contribute. So, you know, we had some retired journalists who helped us figure out a marketing plan and 
we had some people who uh, knew about bookkeeping. So we were able to set up a bank account and all that kind of stuff that you don't really think about when you think about how do I end this, all the actually creating a political campaign stuff was only possible because a bunch of strangers met online and decided to figure out how to move forward together. Wow, after hearing about your entire process to create Voters Not Politicians, I cannot imagine your excitement when you learned that the Voters Not Politicians proposal to establish a citizens redistricting committee had passed. Can you bring me into that moment, what you were thinking? Yeah, I mean, it had been two years about of really hard work on something that none of us had ever done before. Um, I'd never been involved in a political campaign, certainly never ran a ballot initiative. Um, in order to do that, we had to write constitutional language. We had to gather 315,654 voter signatures. And we actually had to go through the Michigan Supreme Court, too, to make sure we could stay on the ballot and then ultimately bring it to the millions of people who voted November 6th. So then to see that it was one of the first races called because it had that much support across the state, um, but it had over 2.5 million people who voted for it, and knowing that the sentiment behind that had really started with those two sentences and just a lot of hard work from people who were willing to dedicate their time and energy and talent and money was such an amazing feeling. It was, you know, leading up through that whole process, we knew what we were doing, the people wanted. We saw that from the very beginning. We took a lot of time to involve people in writing the actual constitutional language. Um, we went and had to gather those signatures and we had lines and lines of people ready to sign it up. So it wasn't the issue, but we had still run into a lot of obstacles um, around special interests being involved and having much more money than all of us around the, the court case. And to finally have, you know, I knew on election day, whether we won or lost, we couldn't have done anything else. We worked our tails off. But then to see that it did work, it really restored my own faith in democracy and the actual process, the justice system, all of that. It was like this breath of fresh air of like, you can work hard, you can do it the right way, and it can work out. I mean, sometimes it doesn't, but in this case it did, and that was so reaffirming and just felt so validating to all the hard work that thousands of people had put in. And, in. Um, and we just, and we knew that this was going to happen because it's a tactic from the opposition. We just got notified today that there's a lawsuit being brought trying to get rid of the amendment that we passed or a section of it. But again, I, I really am hoping that the justice system and our process can continue to work, especially when we're doing the right thing and we're here for the right reason. I, I hope so too. And I really think that the idea that those two sentences on Facebook could spark so much momentum is really inspiring and gives me a lot of hope for the, the future of your work. And on that vein, I'm wondering how you see a role for social media and pro-democracy work. Yeah, it was really cool because I think up until that Facebook post, I felt kind of alone. Um, I knew a lot of my friends, like, cared in general about politics, but I didn't really care about the people or the parties running. I cared about like creating a better system for everybody, but I didn't hear that that's what people were talking about. And so then once I threw that out there to kind of be like, does anybody else care about this? Seeing that not only like a lot of people cared, but like thousands of people would care was so affirming. And I think that was one of the beautiful parts of social media. Um, although some of my friends and family initially hopped on, the majority of the people who all were some of the first volunteers and people really figuring out the committees were all strangers. I before we only met because we we're able to find each other and our like interests online. Um, the other really cool thing too is that so often in politics we use the excuse of not having enough money before we start something. Um, yet these decisions end up impacting every single day of our lives and the other people in our state's lives, and so. The internet and social media really opened up our ability to reach far more people and not have to wait for enough money to go uh, maybe travel to all different parts of our state. We could just connect with people online first and then we could find local people on the ground who were passionate about this issue. And it really allowed us to evolve how we thought about running campaigns and also being able to go and really create an opportunity for um, anybody in the state who wanted to participate be able to. There's, there were still some barriers around not everybody having access to internet or reliable access, 
Um, but we certainly got a head start doing that. And even just finding things like three locations to hold a meeting. When you're just starting and you don't have a bank account, it's not like you can go and reserve stuff with a lot of money. So um, being able to just crowdsource that and say like, hey, does anybody know anywhere in the Thumb in Michigan where I am? So in the Thumb area of our state where there's a free meeting space, and then you could get other people who were really willing to help and add a positive end of social media for that. I love how you're making pro-democracy work so accessible. It sounds like really anyone can connect over social media, over the internet, and become a part of this movement. And now you're, you're, can you continue to make it more accessible as the executive, executive director of the people, which in my understanding is an organization that inspires everyday citizens to become involved in the political process. Um, which seems to align so well with your story from what you've told me. What led you to this organization? Yeah, so a big thing that I discovered when we were starting Voters Not Politicians is that um, so many people had also cared about gerrymandering, just like I had. My day job had nothing to do with politics. I didn't know what I was doing either, but for whatever reason, I was like, well, I'm going to try. I don't know if that's the like millennial in me or just like being a self starter or whatever. Um, but what I quickly realized is that if you were there just as a regular citizen, there actually weren't a lot of organizations there to help you. There were a lot of organizations who said, oh, become a member of ours and then we'll figure out the plan and then we'll go do this according to like our time schedule and what our people say, but there wasn't a lot of people just being like helping us navigate the political process. So even like campaign finance for a political campaign, how to file reports, how to make sure you're in legal compliance. Oh, that's really complicated, especially if it's not your day job. Um, and just having any helping hand whenever we got it was so monumental for us to even end up being successful. Uh, Common Cause is a great national organization and the um, Brennan Center out of New York, but neither of those were actually really active in Michigan. Those were people from outside of our state helping us regular people on the ground. And another thing, when you accidentally make a Facebook post that leads to amending your constitution, um, your story gets shared a lot, which is really cool. And then we'd have a lot of people reaching out from like Ohio and Nebraska and Wyoming saying, you know, I saw that you just decided to do this and here's the issue I really care about. Sometimes it was redistricting, one time it was a dog park that somebody wanted to create. And they were like, you figured out how to do that. How can I figure out how to do this? And I realized that there's so many people who are very passionate and they want to do something. They're just not really sure how. And so I was really tired after the campaign. It was really exhausting working job on top of doing the campaign and everything else that comes with it. But the one thing that was still really motivating to me was thinking about how can I pay it forward? How can I take the stuff that we created, the lessons we learned, the connections that we made that long to do and just help the next people who want to work on democracy in whatever way that they want. To. How can I help bring more uh, people together around common ground? Because that was another great thing we saw is that Democrats and Republican voters were both concerned about these same issues, even though the parties tend to try and pull each other apart instead of finding ways we can get together. So um, I met up with a couple other people, Andrew Shu and Frank Luntz, who had been going around the country kind of seeing a similar thing where there were a lot of people who were frustrated and they wanted to do something about it. They just weren't really sure how to do that thing and they didn't really feel supported. And so we all thought, you know, what if we tried to just create an organization that could take those lessons and help other people, that could help bring people together and teach them give them the opportunity to meet each other so that they can work on what they want to work on. And if we just make it a little easier so that we don't have to recreate the wheel. Because uh, if you think about it, a lot of the mess that we're in is caused by um, special interests who pay people every single day to be working really hard to make the system work for a special few. And the average person isn't paid to go and fix it or be worried about it. And so we're just trying to help even, even the playing field around regular people being able to bring the changes mm -hmm. they want. Absolutely. That's, and that's so inspiring. I think it, hearing your words, it makes it sound that anyone can be part of this work. I'm, I can imagine that your life has changed a lot since <laughs> that two sentences on Facebook. Can you bring me into your day-to-day -day work with the people? What does a day in your life look like? Yeah, yeah, it has changed a lot. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's interesting too, because with leadership comes a lot 
accountability. You know, I'm not a person who's ever been comfortable sharing my personal political beliefs all that much. Um, I like listening to other people's. My family didn't really talk about politics. And so now kind of being somewhat in the spotlight or at least in a leadership position um, has really had to put a lot of pressure on me, I think, to be really reflective and conscious of, of what that looks like. But the opportunity with that is that I can also act as an advocate for helping more regular people be listened to. Because what I started seeing is that the meetings that happen around what's the best policy to, to do or you know, what's the strategy going to be for um, trying to pass something. Those meetings that I never would have been in because it wasn't my job and you know I was just a voter. Started realizing that regular people's voices were never heard. The actual reality of how we experience things on the ground or what it's like to go to a voting booth in person um, wasn't being felt and that opinion wasn't being shared. And so now a big part of what I try and do is add those voices to those tables, trying to find opportunities, working with other organizations or policy organizations and trying to connect some of the people who are volunteering with us who've stepped up and said, you know, I'm really concerned about this and saying, you know, hey, there's this opportunity where they're going to be talking about campaign finance reform in Ohio. Can we make sure we get you to talk about that? Um, we also uh, are building a lot of like workshops and committees to help take some of the lessons that we learned and help other people uh, learn them and, and build tools to make it easier. So like today, I was just on a conference call right before this, uh, where we're building a training out for how do you do effective outreach to new partner organizations. When you are just one person and you're trying to host an event, how can you go and talk to another organization, that kind of stuff. Um, and we do a lot of trying to uh, connect people to how do we help people understand each other. There's so much lost in communication. Um, especially online, which is a big part of where we focus, and so trying to help give tools or um, just offer a different perspective to bridge understanding instead of uh, helping build into the divide is a big thing that we do too. Absolutely. So it seems that much of your work is around building connections and bringing people together. Um, but today's often divisive political climate is something that we've brought up before. Um, we were talking earlier, it seems that it could be so easy given today's political climate to just lose hope and give up um, in building those connections. So what inspires you to keep fighting for a fair democracy? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it can be rough for sure, especially, it's, I think he, there's a lot of trust that needs to be given when building those relationships and it can be so hard, any little sentence can be misinterpreted to then make people assume the worst in each other. Um, but what I saw in Michigan is really what continues to inspire me every day. I saw and experienced myself, you know, part, part of me putting that Facebook post, I didn't mention this, but was actually also not wanting to go to Thanksgiving dinner and have people argue about who they were voting for. And I was like, maybe there's something in politics where again, we can keep talking about it, but we don't have to like call each other evil because somebody voted one way or the other. And turns out my family didn't really know what gerrymandering was. Uh, so it kind of failed that Thanksgiving. But everybody actually ended up volunteering on the campaign. And we, you know, my mom collected more signatures than I did, even though we vote pretty differently. Um, and it was really cool to have something positive to work on together. And seeing how much it meant to people, seeing how being a part of the political process finally makes you feel like you actually do matter in this big system that often ignores most people. Um, seeing that when you do go in with the right intentions and you go in being honest and transparent and just trying to bring people together, that not only can it create a really beautiful, wonderful constitutional amendment, but it also can build relationships and friendships bridging that divide, which is so inspiring. And I think I was really offered the opportunity of a lifetime throughout leading Voters Not Politicians. There were so many people who put their trust in me um, to help lead them, even though I was a stranger to them and, and I put my trust in them. Um, I just wanna pay it forward. I really wanna take the opportunities and the advice and the help that we were able to get and provide that for other people because I saw that it worked. And I also think that it's much easier to be cynical. It's much easier to assume the worst out of somebody else. And, but when you do that, you close off any opportunity to actually make progress. And there's too much going wrong in Michigan. We had the Flint water crisis where, you know, children and families were poisoned and now there's property values that are gonna be deteriorated for years and years to come. 
all because we were too busy pointing fingers at each other to take accountability and actually step up and own mistakes and focus on what matters, which are like the families and lives here in America. Um, and so I think that I want to make sure that I've done everything I can to help contribute and add to that. Uh, and I think I have now, thanks to this experience, at least some perspective that hopefully can be helpful. And I think that, Katie, that's a feeling so many people can connect to, not wanting to go to Thanksgiving dinner or a family event because this political climate and we comes back to our own families. And so it's very inspiring that you're able to find those connections, not only in your own family, but then that you've um, really used that parallel and created this larger movement connecting people. What advice would you give any American in your place um, a couple years ago when you wrote that Facebook post, any American hoping to become involved in pro-democracy work? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple pieces of advice. One is that there is genuinely a place for everybody. No matter what your skill is, if you feel passionately about something, if you're in it because you care for the right reasons, which I mean are like to create a, a more equitable and just system for people, you know, you're not there because you're trying to make profit or something like that. If you're there because you want to help um, as a regular person, there is a spot and somebody needs your help. Um, your vote matters. So often there's literally systems like gerrymandering designed to make it so that your vote doesn't count as much as it should, but you're still a voice. When you have one voice in a room, it might not seem a lot like a lot, but then you get two and then you get 10 and 100 and 1,000 and soon you have 10,000 people who are standing up for something, showing and dispelling the myths being told about this is how Democrats feel, this is how Republicans feel. But that doesn't happen if your voice isn't there, if you're not showing up. Um, and so I think having enough faith in yourself to know that you should be in that room um, and you deserve to be in that room just as much as anybody else, whether you've been in politics before or not, um, you're still impacted by these decisions and you still have a right to be there. Another thing too though, which is with that is never feel like you have the right answer. These issues are so complicated and if anybody thinks that they have solved gerrymandering, you're wrong. You have it. Um, these decisions impact so many people and it's really important to make sure that you're taking into account and creating a process that invites lots of feedback, just like democracy should. It's not just a you know, clear vote. There's supposed to be arguments. You're just supposed to create a better solution together. And I think sometimes people come in and they think, well, if it's not this way, then it's not perfect, then it's not worth it. And that's not true. Um, these things are meant to evolve and technology will change over time. People's voting habits, people where they live will change over time. And so we need to create policies and think about a process that takes that into account. Um, and, you, and we can all learn something from other people to look at something a little differently. Um, and the third too is I think it's a, you know, it's a roller coaster. And just knowing that going in that there's never a quick solution. It's never going to just be easy or just because you're on the right side of something it just works out. It's a lot of hard work but that your persistence and staying focused is one of the best things you can do in order to succeed. There are so many issues going on um, every single day, but we had to get a couple thousand of us to just focus on redistricting, even though when you turn on the news, there's 10 new headlines about so many issues that you care about deeply. But if you can find that one that you think, you know, if I fix this, I think I can make more progress on my other issues. I think a lot of reform issues around democracy can help with that. Um, just know for yourself that it's a, a worthy investment of your time and that your focus is going to be rewarded by being able to really see the bigger picture that if we can fix this for everybody, it leads to a better system overall. Well, Katie, thank you for providing such a great example of investing in solutions for our democracy. Um, I can't wait to see your pro-democracy movement in Michigan grow because of your work and the work of so many other people, it seems like. So thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. And just thanks too. I mean, I think that last point that you just made, this, sure I made a Facebook post, but I would be in a Facebook group alone accomplishing nothing unless a bunch more people had joined. Like this only works when we do decide to get involved and, and it takes all of us. Um, but the really exciting part is that so many people do want uh, to create something better and that works better and for more people. And so um, I'm excited to be able to, to share a little bit of my perspective. Thank you. It seems like there's space for everyone to be a democracy hero.
There totally is. And I've got extra capes. If anybody needs them, I have a lot of superhero democracy capes. So <laughs> I'll send you one. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. All right. Bye.